I know not what to do, my mind is divided. This plain and plaintive line is a translation of a lyric fragment by Sappho, who, in the 7th and 6th centuries BC, wrote many poems that expressed desire for other women. She is said to have led a large congregation of young female students in the worship of Aphrodite, singing hymns of devotion to the Greek goddess of love and beauty on the island of Lesbos, from which the term lesbian derives. More than two millennia later, these exact words would be borrowed by the American poet Hilda Doolittle, more widely known as H.D., to open a poem in her 1924 collection, Heliodora. H.D. was living and writing at a time when, in Britain and the US, censorship forbade lesbians from publishing anything, even in a fictional frame, about their love lives. At a time when a Conservative MP, Frederick McKeeson, would propose that a clause acts of gross indecency between female persons be added to the Criminal Law Amendment Act, while proclaiming that lesbianism induced a sort of nervous exhaustion and even insanity in young girls. At a time when a 1928 novel by Marguerite Radcliffe Hall was officially judged to be obscene and burned in the King's Furnace for containing sentences such as, she kissed her full on the lips and that night they were not divided. It is hard to say exactly what H.D. means by a divided mind. Later, I will speak about her familiarity with Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, who at the start of the 20th century theorised that the mind is split into three parts. The conscious part, which holds what you're aware of, what you can verbalise and think about logically. The pre-conscious, which stores thoughts that can easily be brought to the level of conscious reflection and the unconscious, which contains biologically based instincts, our primitive urges. The unconscious was said to be a hiding place for impulses, wishes, fantasies that are too threatening for the personality to acknowledge fully, so unacceptable that the mind puts up defence mechanisms to keep us from knowing about them. You don't want to know, you might say. Suffice it to say at this point that in the period I'm going to focus on, HD would try to negotiate thoughts and feelings, desires and motivations that were typically deemed threatening and unacceptable by society at large. She did not, however, do it alone. HD formed a romantic relationship with the novelist Briar, pen name of Annie Winifred Ellerman, and theirs is one of the great love stories of modern literary history. Briar is on the left, HD is on the right. As the First World War drew to a close, HD was on the edge of a psychological breakdown. She had suffered the loss of a stillborn child, the collapse of her marriage to a husband who had returned from service with post-traumatic stress disorder, the death of her brother killed in action, swiftly followed by the death of her father. A brief affair with a musicologist, Cecil Gray, had left her pregnant, and in late winter of 1919, her illness from influenza left doctors predicting that she would die. However, just a few months before, HD had met Briar in London. Thanks in no small part to Briar's solicitousness and care, HD recovered and gave birth to a healthy baby, Perdita. Briar and HD pledged love and loyalty to each other and would raise the child together. Their romantic involvement, though, had to be kept from public view on account of the social stigma associated with that which differed from the supposed norm, heterosexuality. Little wonder, then, that HD's most celebrated epiphany, a supernormal awakening that had a transformative effect on her life and art, occurred in the summer of 1919 on the Scilly Isles, a remote archipelago off the Cornish coast, where Briar had taken her to recuperate. The couple spent long hours basking in the warmth on white sand beaches, exploring smugglers' caves and lighthouses, spying seals and dolphins, and it was here that HD had what she and Briar would later call the jellyfish experience. HD recorded it in Notes on Fort and Vision, a manuscript unknown and unpublished until half a century later. In this vision, HD experienced a bell jar or half globe of transparent glass spread over her head, with tentacled connections between her body and mind, generating a newfound sense of safety and well-being, of immunisation from recent catastrophes. Like the slipperiness and porous edges of the zooplankton itself, the significance it feels towards cannot be easily delimited in language. One might say there is a necessary queerness to it, 
resisting an essentialist freezing of identity into something straightforward and coherent that is forcefully defined in line with dominant codes and categories. HD's jellyfish is a metaphor, real in substance and effect. It is equated with a concept of what she called the overmind. The overmind became central to her artistic philosophy and is described as an ecstatic state of heightened consciousness in which superfeelers extend out and about us with the seeming polarities of body and spirit, womb and head, the unconscious and the ego, female and male, finding their contradictions lifted. It does not, however, correspond to the image of a solitary genius, traditionally coded as a brilliant man, channeling potentially divine inspiration. For HD, a grinding discomfort accompanies this mental shift. It is rigorous concentration on one's creative work that leads to the greatest cultural achievements, from Leonardo's Madonna of the Rocks to the sculpture of the Charioteer at Delphi. Crucially, HD also relates it to the minds of two lovers interacting in sympathy of thought, keyed to the same pitch. Though HD underwent therapy with Sigmund Freud, she found herself challenging his ideas in Notes on Thought and Vision, which is in large part a study of psychoanalysis. Whereas Freud tended to view culture as a movement beyond, or indeed a suppression of, sexual activity, HD integrated her erotic desires for women into her work, emphasising the need for a healthy balance between physical and mental development. Freud, who aligned homosexuality with psychological immaturity, with the individual expected to replace such problematic urges with more socially useful pursuits, this would be seen as a deviation from normal functioning. Throughout much of the 20th century, psychoanalysis would take a prejudicial view of gay people, generally treating non-heterosexuality as a mental illness. Thankfully, this is changing, and notably in 2019, the president of the Psychoanalytic Association of America issued a public apology to the LGBT plus community. As for HD and Breyer, they travelled together to Egypt, Greece and the United States before eventually settling in Switzerland. They remained lovers until HD's death in 1961. HD became an icon for both the LGBT rights and feminist movements when dozens of her poems, plays, letters and essays were rediscovered during the 1970s and 1980s. Arriving at the present day and a world that has wrought enormous pressures on people's mental health, while there is growing acceptance of LGBT plus communities, research studies in the UK have indicated that during the pandemic, young trans and non-binary people have reported the highest levels of depression, and the LGBT Foundation Helpline has been receiving 25% more calls about suicidal thoughts during lockdown. Many have been cut off from contact with LGBT plus allies, and those who had moved back in with relatives felt they had been pushed back into the closet. Whatever new normals await as we emerge from the worst of the pandemic, we must be mindful of the reality that many LGBT plus people will continue to need solidarity and support. I hope that introducing you to just a fragment of the story of the poet H.D. and Briar, a story of rescue, artistic reawakening, love overcoming oppressive norms, and of course jellyfish, has provided a little further inspiration for the cause. To close, an excerpt from H.D.'s 1942 long poem, The Walls Do Not Fall, which was dedicated to Briar. But we fight for life, we fight, they say, for breath. So what good are your scribblings? This, we take them with us, beyond death. Mercury, Hermes, Tote, invented a script, letters, palette. The indicated flute or lyre notes on papyrus or parchment are magic, indelibly stamped on the atmosphere somewhere. <laughs>